What is up, everybody? Thanks for joining us. This is myself, and you probably know Dave Burke. Good deal, Dave. If you listen to the podcast, you've definitely heard Dave before. And he came to, I guess, help ask questions. You all have submitted a bunch of questions. And they asked me to start off by explaining why I wrote the book. I'm, I dread doing this because I know you might have already listened to the podcast that I did about this book and why I wrote it, where it came from. But, and then the reason I say I dread is because when I start talking about it, sometimes I might take two hours to explain why I wrote this book or maybe even five hours. So I don't want to spend that much time on why I wrote the book or where the ideas came from, because I do want to get to the questions. We kind of got to peruse really quickly. The questions look like there's some pretty cool questions in there. So the book, this is the book. The book is called Final Spin. I got my first box. Well, I guess I got my first box at the Monster. They shipped the box miles. They also shipped me the, the Final Spin uh, dryer sheets, which people thought we were kidding, but that is for real. That is for real right there. Um, they want to do something to promote the book. Why not do dryer sheets? Well, it takes place in a laundromat. So the characters in the book are based on either composites of people that I knew or some, some version of people that I knew in my life. I think everyone has heard me talk about the fact that I worked at Wendy's when I was a kid. Yes, I was a burger flipper at Wendy's. And when I was working at Wendy's, there was a woman who was probably 50 or 55 years old. She had some kind of a mild intellectual disability and she ran the salad bar at Wendy's, which I came to find out Wendy's doesn't have a salad bar anymore, apparently. So this is in the good old days. I guess post COVID, no one's going to have salad bars, but they used to have a salad bar at Wendy's and she ran the salad bar and she absolutely loved it. She kept all the croutons leveled up in their little container. She had all the salad fresh, the carrot the carrot shreddings were very meticulously beautiful and she loved it. She loved it. She had a smile on her face. She worked really hard. She was constantly checking on it. It was something that made her happy. And for me, 16, 17 year old kid working at Wendy's, she was a lot happier than I was. And what was really interesting, she was a lot happier than most people that I knew. So I always kind of remembered that. I always remembered that fact of this woman that she was happy and it didn't seem like too many other people were happy. And that was what developed the character Artie in the story, who's about 30 years old. He's obsessed not with a salad bar, but with a laundromat. And he works at a laundromat and he loves working at the laundromat. And the laundromat is owned by a couple from Holland. The wife speaks no English. The husband speaks English. The reason I chose laundromat, there's two reasons. Number one, because if you're going to be obsessed with something, I wanted to be, I wanted the, the character to be obsessed with something that's ironic because <laughs> I've never met a person in my life that was obsessed with laundry. Barring a few Marines in my life, especially the drill instructors that put me through officer candidate school who seemed pretty obsessed with laundry and ironing. But I thought it was very strange. You know, people are, people are obsessed with all kinds of things, jujitsu, surfing, archery, chess. What else? A lot of things. NASCAR, yeah. uh, cars in general. People just get obsessed with random things. And I kind of wanted to, to, to play on that a little bit, people being obsessed with things. And if you're going to be obsessed, for, for someone that like me that's obsessed with jujitsu, when I talk to other people, I might as well be talking about laundry because it makes no sense to them. So, so that, was, that was part of it. I also, when I, when I used to go to a laundromat, my wife and I here in San Diego, California, the laundromat that we went to was actually owned by an Asian couple. And the wife didn't speak English. The husband did. The wife, when we would show up to do our laundry, whatever it was, once a week on Sunday afternoon, the wife would tell us jokes in her language and then laugh hysterically. And neither one of us would understand it. We would just laugh because it must have been funny. And that was kind of the idea behind the laundromat. This is the idea behind Artie, who's mildly, you know, got some intellectual disability. 
And then there's the goat and Johnny, who are the other two main characters. And these guys are kind of composite characters of some of me and my friends when we were growing up, causing trouble, getting into trouble. Uh, you know, nothing heinous, but definitely not really contributing society in the in the in the most the most beautiful way. So also the fact that uh, part of this part of this story comes from, and the book is dedicated to a friend of mine that I grew up with, a kid named Jeff Lang. And Jeff Lang was a, a really smart kid, a really funny kid, a really charismatic kid, a handsome kid, an athletic kid, basically a, a, a kid that was much better than me in just about every way. And yet we, we were great friends through about sixth grade, fifth grade, we had class together all day. The whole day was us together with Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker, he, he was a nice guy. He was a good teacher. And he would try and contain these two little maniacs. He would be able to contain me usually, but Jeff had a little bit more rebellion in him than I did. So, you know, if Mr. Parker would say, hey, you guys need to be quiet right now. I'm gonna send you to the office. I would be quiet. Jeff would not, he would get sent to the office. That was sort of the beginning of the divergence after that sixth, seventh grade, seventh grade, we started to we started to go down different paths. And the path that he went down was not not a healthy one. It involved, you know, first alcohol and smoking and then drugs and that whole thing. And we we still remained friends, but he went down that path. I didn't. And eventually uh, he was in pretty rough shape. Um, his life was not going in the greatest direction. And I joined the Navy. And when I joined the Navy, I remember the last time that I talked to him, he was now pretty, pretty rough looking. And he, I told, you know, he had heard, or I told him, Hey, I'm going to the Navy. And this is, you know, when we were kids, we would run around the woods playing war and all that and shooting each other with BB guns, which is not recommended, but it's what we did. And so, you know, he had that sort of innate thing of wanting to be a soldier like I did when we were little, but I actually now join the Navy to go and be some kind of soldier. And I remember him saying to me something along the lines of, I wish I could go with you. And I said, well, you know, hey, why don't you go down and see the recruiter? And, and I saw the look on his face. He, he realized that he couldn't and he was too far down a bad path. So that was that I joined the Navy and probably about six to nine months after I joined the Navy, I called home to check in with my parents. And my mom told me that Jeff had killed himself. So just an awful situation. And, and, and part of this book and part of the underlying theme of this book is people get stuck in tough situations and they don't see a way out of them and they wanna try and find a way out of them. They don't always find a way out of them. So that was another underlying theme. And some of the, some of the banter between the friends is just, good dialogue reminds me of the dialogue that I would have with my friends when I was a kid. And there's a manager in there named Gerald Lundstrom, who they call the weasel, who's a very typical manager, very, very typical bad manager. You know, we work with leaders all the time now at Echelon Front, and this is not the kind of, of leader that we uh, want to see. So through that bad manager in there, and there's just a cast of other characters that that come in. I guess the only other one that plays a, a prominent role would be Jessica. Jessica is Johnny's girlfriend. And, and again, this is sort of a com composite character of, of a lot of girls and women that I knew. And they were just kind of ended up in situations that they really weren't meeting their potential in life and were a little bit trapped there. So, you know, that's the that's that's part of what the book is about and the last thing i'll say about this is when i was growing up it seemed to me like there was a underlying sadness in pe people and and the people that i knew the people that i saw in the world it seemed to me i i guess may, sadness might be a strong word but it at least seemed that life doesn't really work out the way you want it to. And, and that's a reality of, for anyone. So I think that's another, that underlying sadness, that underlying 
situation that we're all in that, you know, you, things are going to happen that you don't want to have happen. And you make some mistakes along the way and you can end up in a bad situation. So that's another one of the underlying themes inside the book. And with that, I said, I wasn't going to talk long. It's been 11 minutes. So let's get to some questions from the crew here. Yeah, I got some questions from the crew before we do that, though. I mean, I think that covers it. And you and I actually did a, a kind of a live interview. If you end up getting the audio book, right. Jock and I go back and forth for like a solid hour and 15 about a bunch of different things that people might be asking, you know, why did you write it? Where did the characters come from? Things like that. Maybe just a little more depth than you just gave. And you and I did that as part of the audio book, which is really cool. Only thing I wanted to just ask you before we got to the, to the reader's questions or the listener's questions was you used the term composite characters. One of the things that I liked about this, and I don't, I don't know if it's a book. I don't know exactly what it is. It's a story. It's a book. It's almost a com combination of, of several different things. But one of the things that I appreciated the most was how authentic it felt. And I remember working as a stock boy at Target as a kid. And not that the characters reminded of me, because at 16, it made sense for me to be a stock boy at Target. But I was working with a bunch of early 20 guys that it didn't really make sense. And the way they talked, the way they interacted, the way they treated their boss, the way the boss treated them, all that was very authentic. But the only thing I want to just ask you is when you said composite characters, you and I were together not too long ago. We were going to a gig together in, in an Uber. And we were talking to the Uber driver. And he was talking about his life and his story. And, and you were really paying attention. And there was pieces of what he was talking about that you were kind of internalizing. And you kind of pay attention to everything. And things that happen around you, whether they're people, situations, people you're interacting with, people you're watching other people interact with, those seem to kind of feed into your brain and you, you kind of store those away. And these characters are, are not just the people you grew up with, but there's a, there's a bunch of people inside these characters. Yeah, I pay attention to life. I pay attention to what's going on. And, and in fact, you know, we get in this Uber and you and I are going somewhere and I, I just, you know, hey, what are you doing? We were in Vegas. So that means we're in Vegas. And, you, you know, you know, people, they end up in Vegas in some, there's a story behind that. Well, this character, uh, he was a salesman. And you could see that. He, I was asking questions, but I didn't need to ask him too many. He was ready to talk. He was a salesman. He was filling us in on stuff, answering questions. And so we had this real salesman type character. And he goes into the fact that, his his previous his his previous life to Vegas was he had or he worked at a company that sold wheelchairs to hospice centers around the country and i was thinking about what a strange dynamic to be this sort of chatty uh uh very salesy type person and what you do for a living is you go into hospice and you sell your, your wheelchairs and he, a couple other medical devices. But that was, you know, that's interesting to me. And I don't know where that's going to end up. I don't know what story it's going to end up in. But it's also, for me, all these things are, are an opportunity to learn about human nature and understand human nature better. So, yes, I am definitely paying attention. Yeah, I know you are. And I think part of the reason I wanted to bring it up is to hear you talk about it. But also, if you're going to read this for the first time, when you see the characters, when you hear the characters, when you, when you as a reader interact with the characters, I guarantee you a piece of one of those composites is going to resonate with everybody who's reading it. And that's a pretty cool thing. And that to me was the most powerful part of the story is inside the composition of all these people, you're going to be able to connect with them in some way because of where they come from. Yeah, I, I would say that you, we as human beings will relate and understand every single character that's, that's in this book. You'll probably know or, or be able to connect these characters to two, three people in your specific life. So that's definitely interesting. And human beings, look, it's one of those dichotomies in life. Human beings are, are very, very different. And yet human beings are also very, very similar in many ways. So Indeed. that's definitely reflected. Right on. All right. I know there's some real questions out there. And the very first question, which means the first person who submitted a question, because I think these come in order from who bought the book first, is Lisa in Chicago. Nice work, Lisa. Her question is, what advice would you give young adults in America 
who are just getting started with their adult life? I guess it depends on, you know, people start their adult life from a lot of different starting lines. <laughs> so depends on, on where you might be, Lisa, in your life. I was very, very lucky. And I'll tell you this story because I, I think it might be applicable. Or you might find a way to apply it. For me, I got very, very lucky because I joined the military. And when I joined the military, all of a sudden, I had a very clear goal in life, which, I, which was that I wanted to be a good SEAL. I want, yes, I wanted to be a SEAL. That was part of it, but I wanted to be a good SEAL. And what that allowed me to do was allowed me to make a lot of decisions based on, is this going to help me be a good SEAL or not? And I think if you get a goal like that, you find something that you're interested in, something that you're focused on, something that you want to do, and you drive towards that goal, then it's very, very helpful in the rest of the decisions that you make. So Lisa, it depends on what you're interested in. If you want to be a writer, guess what I'm going to say? Start writing a book. If you want to be a filmmaker, start making videos. If you want to be an architect, start figuring out how you're going to get into architecture school. If you want to be a doctor, start figuring out what you need to do to get into medical school. Like all those things coming up with something that it is something that you want to do, then I think that's the first step that we have to take in moving forward. So that would be part one. Part two, you can probably guess, take ownership of what's going on. The, the minute you start blaming people because you didn't get into medical school or you didn't get into architecture school or you didn't get into the military, the minute you want to blame other people and, 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 it's no, and it's no part of what you did, that's when we become stagnant and we don't move forward. So figure it out what it is you want to do. Take ownership. Go do it. Right on. Yeah, don't skip that part too. <laughs> All right, next question from Milton, Vermont is Richard. Hey, I'm going to summarize it a little bit. Richard is talking about a scenario, and Jocko's talked about this a few times. When the boss asks you to do something, the answer is, Roger, that boss will get it done. So Richard's in a situation where he's got a boss, and he knows the, the answer is, yes, boss, I'll take care of it. I'll give me more. I'll do whatever you need me to do. But what about when the boss doesn't have any respect for you? How do you tell them that enough is enough or give that task that he's given you to someone else without sounding ungrateful or making it sound like you can't handle the job. So the situation Richard's in feeling a little underappreciated, do you just suck it up and make it happen? Or do you actually take a slightly different approach when you, when you're sort of getting overloaded from the boss? When my boss doesn't appreciate what I'm doing, I'm super happy. I'm super happy because that means my boss, I'm doing such a good job that my boss doesn't even understand the kind of work that I'm doing because it's I've taken it completely off of his plate. I also think this is an excellent opportunity for me to exercise some humility and make sure it's a little ego check. It's a manual ego check, right? Because there's it's you can feel your ego brewing up that my hey, why isn't Dave saying thank you for doing this? What's wrong with him? No, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me that the only reason that that thing is going to make me feel good is him telling me I did a good job. I don't care. I actually enjoy it when I don't get credit. I enjoy it up and down the chain of command. I enjoy when my team doesn't appreciate the cover that I give them, the effort that I give them. I appreciate that. I appreciate it when my peers don't say thanks after I cover for them. And I appreciate it when my boss just looks at me and thinks, oh, he's just doing his job. I love it. It's a great exercise in keeping your ego in check. And it's a great way to build those relationships because eventually, they're going to realize what you are doing. That, that, that is what is nice about thinking strategically and thinking long-term. Eventually, you're going to be sick for a week or something's going to happen where you're not there and they're going to realize what you're doing for them. And then they'll be truly appreciative. So I have no problem with it. Just got to stay humble um, and, and, and this will work itself out. This is no factor. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. <laughs> right on. All right, Michael from Horseheads, New York. A version of this question has probably been asked to you before. What gets you up at 4 a.m. every day? Uh, I got work to do. <laughs> I had somebody ask a similar question. You know, you've written 10 books. How do you write, how do you write 10 books in five years? I'll tell you how. You, you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you start working. So that's what gets me up. The, 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 the heaviest part of this is that you know, having been in the military, Dave and myself, we have friends that we lost that don't have the opportunity to do what we do that didn't come home from overseas. And, and so for, for guys like Dave, for guys like me, just the opportunity to get up and work and produce and try and do something in life that honors the friends that we lost. 
that's that's really all you need in the morning when you get out of bed. Yeah, right on, man. Sarah, Dallas, Texas is asking a good question. You kind of covered it, but what sparked you to write this book, or maybe what sparked you to write this, I guess, fiction book somewhat? I yeah, so th there's two things going on. One is that I have a I have a lot of stories bouncing around in my head, a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, plot lines that are up there. And I'm constantly kind of, they're, they're fighting with each other to see which one gets to come out of my fingertips into the word processor. This, this one won. And, and the reason it won is because there were so many parts of this story that I really wanted to see play out. There's so many interactions between these people. You know, there, this is a this is a story, this is a love story in many ways, and, and not so much the love story between Johnny and Jessica, but more the love story between Johnny and his brother, and just the fact that Johnny wants to take care of his brother, and that's his primary thing he wants to do with his life, and, and so I wanted to see how that played out. I also, again, wanted to explore this idea of people that have a lot of potential but don't ever execute on that potential. And they end up being in positions where they don't want to be. And then how do you handle those things? And then if you're given the opportunity to make a sacrifice for the people you care about, what does that look like? So those are the things that kind of bubbled this one to the surface. And that's kind of the deeper ones. At a more surface level, I love the characters. I love the interaction between the characters. I even when I was reading the the audio book, there was some there were some edits we had to do because I was laughing at my own jokes. I was laughing reading the the dialogue between the characters. There's also you know hugely emotional parts and I, and I talked about this when I got done recording the audio book. The audio engineer, you know, she was laughing hysterically sometimes. She was cheering sometimes, and then sometimes she was she was crying. And so to me, when I was reading the audio book, I felt like okay. This this did what I wanted it to do, or this this can do what I want it to do. Yeah, indeed. From Trey in Evansville, Indiana, what's the one thing you want your reader to take away? What do you want the reader to take away from this book? You know, it says what's the one thing that I would want the reader to take away, and if I had to, you know, narrow it down to one thing and one thing only, I I think the the story conveys the fact pretty strongly that making a sacrifice for other people and and trying to help other people is ultimately the the thing in our lives that will help us become happy. Uh, this, there's definitely a strong thread about happiness. What is happiness? Who gets it? Not everyone gets to be happy in life. How do you get there? So I would say the, the, the one kind of underlying theme that I would like to people take away from the book is, is if you want to find happiness, find it by helping other people. Check. Sean, Kansas City. Again, a version of this question has been asked, but what led you to join the service? And was that something you always wanted to do? Yes. I, like I mentioned with Jeff Lang, when we were little kids, we were running around playing army, shooting each other with BB guns, wearing camouflage, putting burnt cork on our face. And that's what I always wanted to do. That's what I did when I was a little kid. And I never had to grow up because I went in the military and just got to keep doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> right on. Martha from Cumming, Georgia. When did you write your first book? And answer a question I think we know the answer to is, are there plans for you to continue writing books? Yeah. Hey, Martha, how you doing? Uh, yes. So I wrote my first book. My first book came out in 2015. It was called Extreme Ownership. I wrote that with Leif Babin, who I, who I work with in the SEAL teams and who I, I now run Echelon Front with. So that was the first book that I wrote. And I've written, like I said, I think it's 10 books right now. Uh, five of them are kids' books. Five of them are adult books. Am I writing more books? Yes, the next one's already in the works. <laughs> yeah, I get the impression there's a lot of books in your head. You there, just got to get them out on paper. There is indeed. Right on. All right, from Tyler in Cleveland, Ohio. What's one piece of advice for someone to live a well-disciplined life? Get up early every day. Now, now, do you have to get up at four o'clock in the morning? No, but, and you might not be a morning person. You might be one of these people that, you know, works late. And if you stay up until three o'clock in the morning working, I get it. There's people that are more nocturnal in life. That's fine. 
but wake up at the same time every day, make it a little bit earlier than normal. Don't lay in bed. Don't hit the snooze button. I think that that is a, and then, and then once you get up, go do exercise. I think those are two of the, of the foundational things that keep me on the path is I wake up early. I go and do some workout immediately. I think that is the best way. And I, no one wants to hear this. Everyone wants to hear me say uh, something. I, I don't know. They want to hear me say, uh, you know, meditate. Well, I've never really meditated, so I can't say to meditate. They want to hear me say, uh, write down in a journal. Well, I've never really kept a journal, so I can't say that. You know what I do? I wake up early, I work out. So that's the best advice I can give on living a disciplined life. <laughs> right on. Nothing, nothing against meditation and journaling. I've just never done it before. Unless you consider jujitsu meditation, unless you consider writing books, journaling, maybe I am. I don't know. Well, in your defense, you never told anybody how much or how little to sleep. You just say, don't sleep any more than you need. Yeah, that's definitely Do the true. things you need to do, whatever those might be. All right, Peter, Buffalo, New York. Question is, what's something you would charge the next generation with? Charge the next generation with. What is something I would charge the next generation with? I would charge the next generation with opening your minds. And I, and I think that, I, I think that oddly enough, the, sometimes we feel like our minds are opening, but they're actually closing. And what I try and do is I try and go through life with an open mind and I try and listen to other people's ideas when I disagree with someone's idea, I don't close my mind to it. I open my mind more so I can try and understand where they're coming from. So there's a lot of divisiveness in the country right now. I think that comes from a lot of people when they hear a new idea or a different idea or an idea that they've written off, instead of opening their minds and trying to understand it, they close their minds and they don't want to accept any part of it. And what does that do? It closes out that person. It closes out that relationship. It closes out that communication stream. All those things are bad. So let's open our minds, people. Yeah, and you even have mentioned ways or <coughs> maybe the best way to open your mind is to listen to other people. Yes. You say that a lot these days. Yes. Uh, uh, two of the most underrated tools of leadership. One is listening and two is asking earnest questions. Not why the heck would we do that? But hey, can you explain to me where you're coming from? So yes, open your mind, listen ask earnest questions. Right on. All right, Heath, I'm answer, I'm interested in this answer too. Jocko, if you could recommend one podcast of yours to listen to, which one would it be? This is the, this is the Sophie's choice question <laughs> that I get a lot. You know, I would want to know who Heath is. I'd want to know what you do. I'd want to know what your status is in life. Uh, because there's been a lot of podcasts that, that I've done that have had a significant impact on me. And I, I, it would be difficult for me to answer that question. I, I know, you know, you know, there's, there's the Dakota Meyer one, which is very, very powerful. Dakota is an incredible guy. And to have him on the podcast and debrief with him and talk through things. He's a Medal of Honor recipient from Afghanistan. He's in the Marine Corps. Very powerful. I, I'll, I'll never forget uh, you know, as far as, as books that I've covered on the podcast, I did a, a, po a series of podcasts, 121, 122, and 123, and they were about a, a famous Marine, the most famous Marine, the most iconic Marine, Chesty Puller. That, that was the first book that I covered, which is on 121. It was called Chesty, and that rolled right into the next one, uh, which is about Chesty Puller's son, Lewis Puller, who was also in the Marine Corps, and yeah, if you want to take an emo emotional roller coaster and learn some things about the world and life, then I think that's those are those are some pretty powerful ones. But again, I mean, I had Rose Schindler who was in, in Auschwitz, who survived Auschwitz. I mean, what an incredible woman! One of the most incredible and one of the most one of the strongest human beings I've ever met, if not the strongest human being I've ever met. And she's all of about four foot eight, uh, just an incredible human being. Um, you know, Captain Plum, who spent six years in the Hanoi Hilton, um, William Reeder, who was in the jungle prison camps in Vietnam. I, I mean, just I've, I've had such a, a blessing to be able to cover these books and talk to these people. So I, hard for me to narrow it down. Yeah, it's funny because 
the ones you just mentioned were all the ones that popped up in my head. You're over 300 episodes. So it's literally thousands of hours of just that. But in all those Holocaust survivor, Vietnam POWs, Medal of Honor awardees, um, all those stories, you also have a whole bunch of different podcasts too. You talk, you have a business podcast, you have a jujitsu podcast, you have a kid's podcast. So even inside there, the options there of what resonates with the audience member, there's so many different ways that you're communicating in different formats, depending on who you're trying to reach as well. I was almost 100% certain you were going to say that obviously the best podcast that I've ever done was number 69 when I first had Dave Burke on talking about his career in the Marine Corps, which was an awesome career. But uh, yeah, that one's right up there for right sure. There. For sure. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, man. We got uh, TJ from Oxford, Mississippi. What led you to co-found Echelon Front and how did that begin? Uh, as I was retiring from the Navy, I got asked by a friend of mine who is the CEO of a big company, he asked me to go up and talk to his executives about leadership. I went and did that. When I got done, he asked me to come talk to every division in his, in his company. I started traveling around the country, talking to all of his divisions. At one of those divisional meetings, the CEO of the parent company was there. He asked me to come and talk to all his CEOs. He owned about 45 or 50 companies at the time. Once I did that, a bunch of those CEOs asked me to come and talk to their companies and, and there you go. Leif, Leif uh, came and started helping me out, covering down on some of these gigs. Eventually, so many people were asking us for documents or something we could give to people after the, after the briefs that we gave them. We looked at each other and said, well, we guess we better write this stuff down. That turned into extreme ownership. And, and really, the rest is uh, kind of how I ended up here. You're actually forced to bring on other people as well. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> Right on. Hey, Cassidy from Phoenix, Arizona, answer this. Maybe you can go in a little more detail. We know you get up early. We know you work out. What's your morning routine? Morning routine. Yep. I, I, I get up. I, you know, brush my teeth, put my PT gear on. I go and work out. My workouts, depending on what I have planned for the day, can be anywhere between 15, 20 minutes all the way out to a couple, three, two, three hours. Uh, that's what I do. I get done. I usually don't eat until around... 10, 30, 11, I'll start nibbling on some food, but that, that's my morning routine. It's not definitely not complicated. Definitely not complex. I don't, that's it. That's as simple as that. How often are you trying to get things like surfing and jujitsu into your full day's routine? Not just the morning, but how often are you trying to make that part of your day? hundred percent of the time. Always trying to make that part of my day. Yeah. Right on. Uh, I think in this case from Germany, I think it's Jan. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Jan from uh, Nordheim, Westfalen, Germany. Accent was terrible, but um, not all of your members share the same goal. What do you do? In my department, not everyone wants to win, but some want to work as little as possible. So how do you solve that problem? So what I do is I try and align my goals with their goals. So if I'm working with Dave and he doesn't want to work very much, what I say is, hey, Dave, the better we do, the, the more efficient we become, the less we're going to have to work and the more money we're going to make. So let's figure out, maybe we have to work hard right now for six months or a year, but then we can get some efficiency set up. You can actually hire some people underneath you and they can kind of cover down on some of the busy work and free you up to do some more things that you like. So if I have somebody that wants to do something different than me, I figure out how we can, how we can get those goals aligned. And once I get those goals aligned, it's pretty easy to move forward. Indeed. All right, I don't have a name for this one, but it's a question about how you became who you are today. He's talking about obviously the service helped you with discipline, but how were you raised to join the military and the SEAL teams? And is there a specific person that helped you become who you are today? I mean, I, I think I had a pretty normal childhood. Both my parents were school teachers. I was like not great at anything. I was pretty average across the board. I, I just wanted to be some kind of a commando, luckily. Uh, and then once I got in the SEAL teams, I, I definitely paid attention. I always looked at things from a leadership perspective. Part of the reason I looked at things from a leadership perspective is that I wasn't that great at anything. I wasn't the best shot. I wasn't the best diver. I wasn't the best swimmer. I wasn't the fastest runner. I wasn't the strongest weight guy. So what could I bring to the team? Well, luckily, I was pretty good at stepping back and looking at chaotic situations and figuring out what to do. You know what that does? That puts you in leadership positions. I didn't I wasn't striving for it. I didn't say, oh, I want to be in charge. I just kind of de facto ended up there. So I, I just paid attention to the leaders that I had. Definitely in the book, Leadership Strategy and Tactics, I talk about my second platoon where I ended up working for a, a really incredible leader. 
And that guy had a huge influence on me in terms of not only what I wanted to do with my life, because he made me want to become a SEAL officer so I could take care of a SEAL platoon, but also the humility with which he led, which was incredible, especially given how experienced and talented he was. He was very humble. And that's why he's uh, the, the role model for me. And the other role model I have, as you, you probably know, if you know much about me, is the guy that wrote this book right here called About Face. Colonel David Hackworth, and I ended up writing the forward to the reissue of this book, but that book has been a incredible mentor to me. I never met David Hackworth, but that book is a, an incredible leadership book, incredible lessons from there, and I stole all kinds of stuff from him as a leader, and I, and I still steal it every day, so those are some things that helped me out right on. All right, Eric from Washington, and Eric's kind of asking on behalf of people who are starting out, who are new in their career, how can the common man live a life of discipline and rise to be a leader in their community or workplace? So look, uh, being a disciplined person has, I mean, everyone has the opportunity to be disciplined. And, and I think that what you find is, and this is what I find, one of the reasons that I became disciplined, again, it boils or it's rooted in the fact that I wasn't great at anything. I was very common. Uh, you know, I was about average in my SEAL training class. Uh, you know, I wasn't winning runs, that's for sure. I wasn't winning swims. You know, I was in the middle of a pack for just about everything. And when I got to a SEAL team, I was looking around at some of the other guys. They were, they were studs and I was kind of average. So what did I need to do to, to be able to stay on par with them? I needed to have more discipline. I needed to work hard. And I, I found that I, the harder I worked, the luckier I got. The more disciplined I was, the more leadership positions I was put into. So I think if you focus on doing a good job, controlling what you can control, imposing discipline on yourself, stepping up, taking things off other people's plates, you're going to end up finding yourself in a leadership position regardless of where you start. The world, I'm telling you, we work with companies all the time. If you're a hardworking person, if you're a disciplined person, if you're a humble person, the world is screaming for you. They the Companies are screaming for you. There's so much opportunity out there. If you're willing to work hard and stay humble, it's there. Uh, I don't think that's a, I don't think it's, it's not easy. I don't want to say it's easy, but if you have the, the will, you can absolutely make it happen. It doesn't matter where you are in life. Dude, there is no doubt about that. All right, from Stockholm, Sweden, I think it's Christopher Cortez. How do you stay positive when the worst evil acts in the world have been committed on someone close to you? How do you as a bystander move forward and carry some of that burden? So for that question, you know, what, what I want to do from situations like this when, when horrible things happen, first of all, I want to learn from them. I want to learn, okay, what happened? What went wrong? What could I do better? What could I have done different? How could I have improved this situation? That's number one. So number one is yes, to look back and see what we can learn. Number two, we don't want to dwell there. So, so I don't want to be I don't want to look back and say, I made this mistake and now this horrible thing has happened and it's my fault and I can never correct anything. I can never do anything about it. And I don't want to dwell in the past because the past is gone. And as a matter of fact, if something horrible has happened to someone else, you don't want to, have, you don't want to drag them into the past. You want to let them move forward. So I think that's my, my main advice right there is number one, yes, see what lessons you can learn. Number two, don't dwell on, on the past. You have to move forward. And then your, your last part of the question, which was, how can you help share some of that burden? And, and, and the answer is there, what can you do to help other people, right? So if something bad happened to someone that you know, how can you help people become aware of it? How can you help prevent those things? You know, um, we have a, uh, we, we lost a guy in, in my task unit named Mark Lee, and his mom has made it her mission to help other veteran families, to help Gold Star families. And that's what her mission is. And of course, this is a daily reminder of what she's lost, but she's doing everything she can to help other people that face those kind of struggles. So that's it. Number one, learn what you can. Number two, don't dwell in the past. 
Number three, figure out how you can help other people. That's the best way to move forward in that situation. All right, I got Wayne from Lakeville. Of the different podcasts you do, which one is your favorite? And I think he's calling you out a little bit. His son, who's 11, wants to know, when's the next Warrior Kid podcast coming out? Uh, I kind of went through the favorite podcast thing. It's a tough one. And I apologize to your young Warrior Kid. Obviously, I need to impose more discipline on my life and get more Warrior Kid podcasts out there. So we will continue to work on that. But appreciate the appreciate you raising the Warrior Kid. And thanks for the Warrior Kid there for listening. That's awesome. Right on. Ashton from Bolivar, Ohio. Do you have different mantras for each business or the same to help you keep pushing through the hard, challenging times? I don't I, no, I don't have different mantras for each of the businesses. I have the same mantras. And you can probably guess what the mantras are that I have for all my businesses. Cover, move, simple, prioritize, and execute, decentralized command, <laughs> extreme ownership, keep things simple, be default aggressive. Those are uh, the, the things that, the things that I've written about in the leadership books, those are actually how I, how, how I operate and how we operate our companies. So uh, for example, you know, we have Jocko Fuel. It's total decentralized command. I, I barely know when new product is coming out. I tested it, you know, two months ago, helped come up with a formula or approve the formulas that, that were created. I do the taste testing. And then next thing I know, I look up and there's a new product coming out. There, there's things that happen at Echelon Front, our consulting company. Dave's got one of our, our top clients that we've been working with for a few years, multi-million dollar contract. We just re-signed with them. I've never worked, I've never worked with that company. So it's a company that's that that is paying us a lot of money. I haven't worked with them. Why is that? It's decentralized command. Dave's out there, you know, running that project and making it happen. So that's that's the way it is with with all my companies. Those are my mantras. The mantras, there's no secret. I I've written them all for you that there's no question what my mantras are. Yeah, the cool part about the mantra is it works in every business and every situation. So it's legit. All right, Alex, Northern Ireland. What advice would you give a 19-year-old just starting out on his career who's not sure where he wants to go or what he wants to do? I would look and see if there's anything that you're interested in. There has to be something that you're interested in. It, it, there has to be something that you're interested in that you can look at and say, hey, I really like jujitsu. I'm going to go down that path and start figuring out how to get good at jujitsu and open a jujitsu school one day, or I really like sewing. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start figuring out how I'm going to sew uh, handbags and I'm going to sell handbags. There's a million different things that you can do. Whatever you're interested in, I would go forward with. Now, if that's not good enough and you say to yourself, yeah, but Jocko, I just don't know what to do. I ha actually have an answer for that too. If you're content with where you're at, meaning you don't know which direction to go in, which to me, if you don't know which direction to go in, that means you're happy where you are right? If you don't look at a, a mountain and say, I want to cl climb that mountain, then that's you saying, okay, I'm comfortable where I am. If you're comfortable where you are in life, meaning you're not quite sure which direction to go in, my answer to you is help other people. Go and help other people. Find people that need support, that need help. Go, go and help them and you will find, uh, you, that will lead you to the path of what you want to do for yourself as well. Brittany from Minnesota. <clears throat> Jocko, have you ever considered going into law enforcement and any advice you'd give to people looking to get, looking to get into that line of work? Yeah, well, actually, I, I am a reserve police officer, so I, I'm very supportive of law enforcement. And I can tell you from doing that job, that is a very challenging job. It's a very difficult job. And it, it's a job right now that's been come under all kinds of scrutiny. And what that scrutiny tells me is that we need more good police officers out there. Uh, so what advice would I have? Look, the, the same advice that I give all the time for the, all these other things that we talked about. Yes, cover, move, simple, prioritize, and execute, decentralized command. But something that I focused a lot in the book, Leadership Strategy and Tactics, and that is learning how to detach. Detach from situations, detach from chaos and mayhem, detach from your emotions. There's nothing that I find more impressive than a law enforcement officer that's having somebody yell insults at them scream and yell, and they don't get emotional. They maintain their professionalism. That's what, that's what police officers need to do. So I would focus on that as you go into that career, focus on how you are going to learn to detach in tough situations.
Yeah, and listen, Jocko, you say this to everybody we work with, but you you seem to emphasize it a lot when you work with law enforcement, which we do regularly. At least once a month, we're doing a law enforcement engagement. You also talk about training. And that detachment, you talk about training to detach, train jujitsu, train with your weapon, train communication, train in all those scenarios. And, and you you do a, uh, you emphasize a lot the need to train in, in that line of business as much as anywhere. Yeah, you can't just read about detachment and think you're gonna be able to do it. You need to put yourself in stressful situations. You need to put yourself in shoot, don't shoot situations with sim munition or paintball and then deal with that. See what it feels like. Learn what those warning signs are that go on on your head. So you learn how to deescalate, not just with other people, but how to deescalate yourself. All right, Casey from Missouri, what advice do you have on pivoting? Something didn't work as well as expected. How best do I collect myself and move in the next direction? Uh, similar to the answer I just gave about when you experience some kind of tragedy. If, if something didn't go the way I want it to go, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, okay, what lessons can I learn from that? What can I take away? And now it's time to move forward. So if you keep saying, oh man, I should have signed that deal. I should have closed that deal. I should have opened up that store. I should have created that product. All those things are in the past. You can't change them. All you can do is say, what can I learn from them? And now let's move forward. That's the best thing to do. You don't think it's better to just dig into that position and refuse to <laughs> maneuver? I, I think that digging <laughs> into positions and refusing to maneuver is not a good move. Right on. All right, I got Steve calling, uh, uh, writing in from Winchester, Virginia. He doesn't have a question, just wants to thank Jocko for all the work, but there's a pretty legit shout out to Echo Charles for his technical skills mm -hmm. and for all the uh, the Leif bombshells and all the gouges he's been passing. So thanks to Jocko, Echo, and Leif. That's pretty legit. John from St. Clair Shores, Michigan. Being a Navy SEAL and dealing with mental toughness, what was your most memorable, proud moment of your life and what was your most challenging? Also, how did you overcome it? Uh, I would say the, mo the proudest moment for me in the SEAL teams was we were just out on a patrol in the Battle of Ramadi. It was towards the end of our deployment. And I was just a gunner, uh, just a shooter in, in a platoon. I wasn't, I wasn't the leader. I was just, you know, out tagging along with a platoon on one of their patrols. And as we were maneuvering through the streets, I was sort of sitting there watching from a rear security position, just watching the, the task unit just move and seeing that they were, they were, they were about as perfect as a military unit could be at that time. This is after, you know, coming to the end of a six month deployment. I see everyone is moving perfectly. They're, all angles are getting covered. Weapons are in the ready position. Everyone just looked outstanding. And I remember I think to myself, man, it's, um, it's, a, it's an honor to be a part of this. And then, and then obviously the, the worst thing and the hardest thing to deal with is uh, losing guys in combat. And those are, those are the, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a horrible dichotomy that the best times of my life were in, 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 in a combat leadership position in the battle of Ramadi and the worst times of my life were in a combat leadership in the battle of Ramadi, losing guys won't ever forget those guys. And again, the question of how, how do you move forward? It's, it's what I've been saying this whole time. What can we learn? Now let's remember, but we are not going to dwell in the past. We're not going to focus on, on the loss. We're going to focus on moving forward, taking lessons learned and going out and executing the mission. Right on. Henry from Los Angeles, you'll have to explain this one. How did you end up on the cover of the Force Reality album? Uh, yeah, that was a band when I was growing up and John Bozak, who did all the art for the Way of the Warrior Kid stuff, uh, he ended up putting that album out or doing the art for the for the cover of that album. And what what more beautiful uh, model for the art than this guy right here? <laughs> yeah. All right. I got a uh, question from Amber in Australia. Given your life journey and adversity faced, what does having a successful book mean to you? And what's the potential impact of this book on the people and things that you cared about? <sighs> I mean, look, it's, it's always cool to write something or create something that other people like, but that, that's not really what I focus on. And, and I think, you know, with the podcast is a good example of the fact that if you're going to make a popular podcast, you don't make my podcast. You don't make five-hour podcasts about the atrocities of, of war. You don't sit there and read historical books for hours and, and that's how you get a popular podcast. 
I, I don't really think that I, I'm not in a situation where I try and please people or, or, or create things so that people will like them. I create things that, that f for lack of sounding or for, uh, be wary of sounding self selfish. I create things that I like. I create things that I want to hear. I create things that I'm interested in. And so that's the same thing with this book. This book is, is raw. It's emotional. It's heavy, but it's funny. It's, it's, uh, punchy, right? I didn't like these law, you know, I didn't want it to be this long drawn out story that takes forever. I wanted to be able to hit people. You know, you go to a movie, a movie's two hours long and a good movie can leave you with an emotional impact. This book will probably take you two, two and a half, three hours to read. And it, it should hit you the same way. So for me, um, that, that is what is important is is uh, not so much, hey, this is a critically acclaimed book. And I never wrote any book to, to make that. I never make any podcast. I never make a podcast and say, oh, wow, people really like this. People really want, you know, that's why I haven't really had celebrities on my podcast. I mean, my podcast is popular. If I wanted to land celebrities, I could. I don't really generally uh, think too much about that. So I'm kind of doing what I'm doing. And it's, I'm super stoked that other people are into it. I think that's a lot of luck uh, as far as the impact that this book will have. I, I think, I think it will open people's eyes. I think it will allow people to see themselves a little bit in these characters. I think it'll allow people to maybe do some course corrections in their own lives. And, and most of all, I think it'll teach people to be more appreciative of each other and think about each other in a different way, which I think is going to be helpful to anyone that reads it. All right, Anthony from Cincinnati, in your experience in writing and consulting, what would you say is your engine in deciding how a story should be presented? Is it logic, creativity, or a combination of both? It is a combination of both. Yeah, you don't, you, you want to tell a good story, but the story has to be cohesive and make sense. And you can't sacrifice the sensibility of a story in order to, in, in order to make it emotionally impactful. So you got to find that balance. Indeed. All right. Arvid from Sweden uh, was inspired to enlist in the Swedish army this year. Nice work, man. Question he's got is before your first ever combat deployment, how did you come to terms with the risk of death and injury, not only for you, but for the men who followed you? Look, I wanted to be a commando since I was a little kid. And when I joined the SEAL teams, I, I thought that that was sort of a predetermined outcome. And that's actually the wrong. I, I didn't know it, but I had heard that there was like a 50% death rate for SEALs. It was totally wrong. It was based on, I think it was loosely based on the, the, the guys that did the underwater demolitions in Normandy. They had a 50% casualty rate. So I, from a young age, when I joined the SEAL teams, thought, hey, I might die doing this job. And I'm okay with that. Certainly as I got older, I became very, I, I accepted that very much the fact that 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 I could die and I didn't let it bother me and it doesn't bother me to this day that's what I signed up to do and if that's the way it went so be it but the the harder much harder thing to deal with is the other part of your question which was which was one of my guys getting killed and that was a, a, a knot in my stomach every day that I was on deployment and it's something that what what you can do is you have to focus on the things that you can control. And there's certain things that you're not gonna be able to control. There's, if your team goes out and a bad guy sprays a machine gun down an alley, there's a chance no one gets hit. There's a chance no one gets hit. There's also a chance that three or four guys get hit and two of them die. That, that's the reality. And there's, you can't control that level of luck. What can you control? Train, prepare. Uh, do good intelligence analysis to figure out what's going on, mitigate the risk as much as you can. So those are the things you can control. That's what I always focused on, what I can control. I think if you end up focusing on things that you can't control, like the fact that there's a chance you might get blown up or one of your guys might get blown up or shot, if that's what you're focused on, you're gonna be so worried you're not gonna be able to do your job. So focus on the things that you actually have control over, training, preparation, planning. Right on. Matthew from Tempe wants to know about what cities are going to be added for the uh, Jocko Live. 
tour. Uh, right now, I'm looking at Detroit. I'm looking at Chicago. I'm looking at Hotlanta. Uh, those are the ones right now that I'm looking at. Right on. And you've got uh, San Diego and Austin coming up. Seven. San Diego is the 13th, November 13th, and Austin is November 20th, Saturday and Saturday, a week apart. Right on. I think it's Rowdell from uh, Chico, California, recently married three weeks ago. Any advice for a, a healthy marriage and for soon to be fathers? Yep. Cover, move, simple, prioritize, and execute, decentralized command. So you got to support your wife. You got to cover, move for each other. You got to keep things simple. By th what that means, you both got to be on the same program. You both got to be trying to do the same thing. If you, if she's trying to build a business and you're over here trying to set up your own career and you're not working together, you're working opposing to each other, it's not going to be good. You got to figure out how you can do that together. Uh, prioritize and execute. There's all kinds of crazy things going on when you're married. You got to figure out what the biggest priorities are. Uh, and then decentralized command. You say you got a kid coming. Great. As soon as you can, you start decentralized command with that kid. Let them tie their own shoes. Let them make their own lunch. And, and then finally, extreme ownership. Listen, there is nowhere it's more critical in your life when you're married than for extreme ownership than with your wife or with your husband. Because if all you do is blame them when things go wrong, you're never going to have a good relationship. It's just not going to happen. So figure out how you can look at problems and take ownership of the problem and do your best to get the problem solved. The minute you point your finger at your spouse, you're going in the wrong direction. Point that finger at yourself. Right on. I know we're about done at the top of the hour. I got the final question from Brad. This is a good one. Sounds like Brad's a generic neighbor of yours. He's <laughs> expecting you to just drop the book off at his house, but uh, he actually wants to know what your dog's name is. What's up? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if I had your address, I'd just run by in the morning. Yep. My dog's name is Odin. German Shepherd, 120 pounds. And he's my little running partner in the morning. <laughs> Awesome. Is that it? Dude, that's what I got, man. All right. Hey, everybody. It looks like we're about out of time. Um, once again, I guess they wanted me to say that if you still, if you haven't gotten a signed copy yet, then if there's a link, I guess it's below me. I've never done this before. I hope there's a link below me. I can't see it, but allegedly there's a link below me that if you want to order a signed copy, first a dish of the book, you can do it there and appreciate everyone's support. Appreciate you spreading the word. Um, there's uh, it's a very strange world, the literary world of books, the fiction world of books. They're, they're apparently, I don't know this yet, apparently they're very hostile. They don't like people to be successful. They want you to fail. So I appreciate everyone joining in and doing your best to make sure that, that I don't fail. And if I do, hey, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to adjust and I'm going to move on. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Dave, thanks for joining me. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you out there. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times bestselling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.